The most important equations governing general relativity are the Einstein field equations, and in this video I'm going to give you an overview of what the Einstein field equations are, what they represent, and what their solutions represent. In a future video I'm going to go over the Einstein field equations in more detail, carefully develop them, and eventually solve them for some simple cases, but that'll be once I've covered more material in my tensor series. A couple of videos back in my general relativity playlist, I described the true nature of gravity as the manifestation of space-time curvature. I also stated that the reason we observe objects orbiting giant masses and curving in gravitational fields is that they follow geodesics within that curved space-time surface, and those geodesics on a curved surface are curves. But where does space-time curvature come from? Well, when I talked about how gravity is the manifestation of space-time curvature, I used the example of light bending in a gravitational field, like this. Now what causes this gravitational field? Let's go back to classical physics to answer that question. From classical physics, you know that mass results in a gravitational field. But in general relativity, the idea of gravitational field and gravitational pull is kind of obsolete, and in fact has been replaced by space-time curvature. However, the same principle still applies, just as mass causes a gravitational field and gravitational pull in classical physics, in general relativity mass results in space-time curvature, in gravity. But it's not just mass, energy too can cause space-time curvature if we want to be as general as possible. So just like how mass resulted in a gravitational field in Newtonian physics, mass and energy cause space-time curvature in general relativity. Mass and energy cause space-time to warp and curve from its default flat configuration of the Minkowski space from special relativity. This warping slash curving of space-time is responsible for what we observe as gravity. So now we've established a link between mass energy and space-time curvature, but is there a way we can describe quantitatively how an object with mass and or energy warps space-time? For example, can we calculate what the geometry of space-time looks like around a 1 kilogram mass? What about around a bigger mass, like Earth or the Sun? The answer is yes, and the way to calculate that relationship between mass energy and space-time curvature is to use the Einstein field equations. The Einstein field equations are a set of 10 coupled nonlinear partial differential equations, which are nearly impossible to solve unless you make simplifying assumptions. In the most basic sense, the Einstein field equations describe the relationship between space-time curvature on one side and the amount of mass energy distributed in space-time on the other side. The more mass energy you have, the more your space-time hypersurface will be curved or warped, so we can say that space-time curvature directly increases with the mass energy distribution. I've written this direct relationship as a proportionality, so space-time curvature is, in a sense if we describe it properly enough, proportional to the mass energy distribution in space-time. We can then express this proportionality as an equation with the proportionality constant kappa. In a future video, we'll show that this kappa is 8 pi g over the speed of light c to the power 4. You can imagine that with the universal gravitational constant g being 10 to the negative 11, and the speed of light being 3 times 10 to the 8, that this kappa is a really, really small number. This means that a tiny 1 kilogram mass will do very little in terms of causing appreciable space-time curvature. You need a very large mass to do that. Now what about these two terms in the equation, the space-time curvature and the mass-energy distribution? Well, the mass-energy distribution is typically written with a tensor T, whose components are denoted by T sub mu nu. This is also known as the stress-energy tensor, or the stress-energy-momentum tensor. Meanwhile, the term on the left-hand side is written in terms of the Ricci tensor R, minus half the Ricci scalar R, times the metric tensor G, plus capital lambda times the metric tensor G again. The components of these tensors are once again written with the Greek subscripts mu and nu. Again, this R with the subscripts denotes the component of the Ricci tensor. This capital R is the Ricci scalar, which you get from taking the trace of the Ricci tensor. The G is the metric tensor with components G mu nu, and the capital lambda is a special quantity known as the cosmological constant. So now, in terms of the tensors and their corresponding components, we can write the Einstein field equations like so. Sometimes you can move the cosmological constant term to the right-hand side and just incorporate it into the stress-energy-momentum tensor, which will make your left-hand side more compact, but I've chosen not to do that here. Now let me explain this Einstein field equation a little bit more. 
these Einstein field equations govern four-dimensional space-time. So each of these tensors can be written as four by four matrices. So the mu and nu actually vary from zero to three, zero being the index for time and one, two, and three being the spatial indices x, y, and z. But these tensors are also all symmetric, so the matrices representing them are equal to their transpose. This means that instead of solving 16 separate equations for each of the 16 components, we just have to solve 10 equations because 6 of the equations will just be repeated. In addition, the Ricci tensor on the left directly arises from the metric tensor. So if you know what your metric tensor is for your space-time configuration, you can automatically find the Ricci tensor after a series of complicated calculations. Of course, the reason we don't just write everything on the left in terms of just the metric tensor is that it would make our equation really long and we prefer to make things look more concise instead. This means that in the end, if we know the mass energy distribution across space time, so if we know the stress energy tensor T, that means that we can find the geometry of our space time in terms of the metric tensor G by solving the Einstein field equations. And this is the quote unquote classic way to solve the Einstein field equations. You know the distribution of mass and energy beforehand, so you plug that into the equations and then determine the unknown metric tensor. So your stress energy tensor is known, but your space time geometry, your metric tensor is unknown. There's many examples of solutions you can get from solving the Einstein field equations this way. For instance, if I solve the Einstein field equations in a vacuum without any mass or any source of energy that would result in space-time curvature, so the Einstein field equations in flat space, I would end up with the Minkowski metric eta, which looks like this. Oftentimes, though, instead of writing the metric tensor solution in the form of a matrix, we just incorporate the metric tensor components into our infinitesimal line element, which would look like this for Minkowski space. And this is how the metric tensor determines the geometry of your space-time surface. It gives you information on how to calculate distances between points. In this case, the metric tensor gave you information on how to calculate distances between really close-by events in flat space. Take c squared times the negative squared of the time separation dt and add the sum of squares of the spatial separation dx, dy, and dz. For more curved space-time geometries, we end up with different metric tensors. For instance, if we solve the Einstein field equations for the space-time geometry outside an uncharged, non-rotating sphere, so in the case of a spherically symmetric mass m, we get a metric tensor which corresponds to the following line element. Note that r, theta, and phi are the usual spherical coordinates. r is the distance from the origin, theta is the angle relative to the positive x-axis, and phi is the angle relative to the positive z-axis. Meanwhile, r sub s is a special quantity known as the Schwarzschild radius, given by 2gm over c squared. If your spherical mass is smaller than this radius, then interesting things start to happen, but we'll discuss those in a future video. This whole solution, by the way, is known as the exterior Schwarzschild solution. It describes the geometry outside a spherically symmetric non-rotating mass. For the part inside the mass, you'd need the interior Schwarzschild solution, which doesn't really come up that much, but exists nonetheless. Now, there are also metric tensor solutions for a bunch of other cases. One example is if you have a spherical mass, but this time that mass is rotating, you'd end up with a metric tensor that corresponds to the Kerr solution, the Kerr metric. For the case of a non-rotating but charged spherical mass, you end up with the Reissner-Nordstrom metric. Now this is just one way to deal with the Einstein field equations, to assume a mass-energy distribution and solve for the corresponding space-time geometry. But we can also work in reverse. We can hypothesize a space-time geometry and then solve the Einstein field equations to get the mass-energy distribution needed to achieve that space-time geometry. This has been done a few times for some exotic cases. For instance, the Alcubierre metric, which I've stated here, describes the space-time geometry of a warp drive, which is basically a bubble in the space-time surface that is allowed to move faster than light. I'm not going to discuss the individual terms in the Alcubierre metric, I'll leave that for a future video. Now you might say that this isn't possible, and that's true in most cases. You can't accelerate a mass to the speed of light without an infinite amount of energy. That result comes from special relativity. But in this case, we're not accelerating a mass. We're moving the space-time fabric at a speed that's faster than light to an outside observer. Inside the warp bubble, which is described by the function f, you still can't move faster than light, but to an outside observer, the warp bubble and whatever's inside those are moving faster than light. They're allowed to travel faster than light. 
moving space-time itself has no speed limit, but there are still several issues. The most notable one is that in order to generate this Alcubierre geometry, you need a negative energy density, which isn't physically possible. Well, it might be if you look at, say, Casimir vacuum energy, but there's no practical way to harness that and create such a warp drive. And the way to show that you need a negative energy density is to solve the Einstein field equations, which is what Alcubierre did in his 1994 paper, where he first discussed this warp drive metric. Anyway, that should do it for this video. In the next lesson, I'm going to dive deeper into the Schwarzschild solution, specifically the exterior Schwarzschild solution, as well as some of the key physics implications, like black holes. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the faculty of Khan, signing out.